we're here to celebrate Natasha Lance Rogoff. For her book, Muppets in Moscow, the unexpected crazy true story of making Sesame Street in Russia. Natasha Lance Rogoff is an award-winning television director, producer, and writer of more than 25 years. Her previous credits include executive producer of Ulitsa Sesum, I hope I said that right, uh, and that is Sesame Street in Russia, and producer of Plaza Sesamo. After studying at the Leningrad State University, she wrote about Soviet underground culture, as well as one of the earliest exposés of the Soviet government, persecution of the Russian LGBTQ community in the San Francisco Chronicle. Her 1985 film, Rock Around the Kremlin, about underground rock artists, aired on ABC TV's 2020. Lance Rogoff embedded herself with hardline Russian communist fascists for two years, filming Russia for Sale, which aired on ABC's Nightline with Ted Koppel, the night of the failed 1991 coup that ended the Soviet Union. She is now an associate in the Art and Film and Visual Studies Department at Harvard University and lives between Cambridge, Massachusetts and New York City. Joining Natasha in conversation tonight is Susan Glasser, a staff writer for The New Yorker and author of its weekly Letter from Trump's Washington, as well as a CNN global affair analyst. She has co-written many books with her husband, Peter Baker, including the most recent, The Divider, Trump in the White House, 2017 to 2021, which we have the pleasure of hosting at the end of September. So now, please join me in welcoming Natasha Lance Rogoff and Susan Glasser. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, we love being at Politics and Prose, and we're super grateful to everyone here on a gorgeous afternoon uh, <laughs> for coming inside, at least for a few minutes. And I'm really delighted that you did, because I think this book is a real treat uh, to discuss. And I'm, I'm personally excited to have this conversation. Uh, in fact, we just sort of already started jumping in uh, in the green room here. And I have many questions for the author. Uh, and I have to say, it is a really lively read. Um, and she's just new to the book promotion game, so I'm going to shamelessly promote it on her behalf. Uh, this, the book is Muppets in Moscow, the unexpected, crazy, true story of making Sesame Street in Russia. And I think it is, although it is about Russia in the 1990s, it's, it's a book that you should read if you want to understand Russia today, too. And that, I think, is something that really makes it different and unique. And also, it's about Sesame Street, and everybody loves Sesame Street, so... It's that too. But Natasha, thank you so much for writing this book and for being with us this afternoon. Uh, we're excited. Congratulations. Well, th thank you, Susan, so much for coming and, and everybody for coming today on this glorious day. And um, especially uh, Susan just had her own book come out recently, uh, The Divider. So um, it's very sweet of you to make time for this too. Really appreciate oh, it. Are you kidding? This is a book that's not about Donald Trump. You know? <laughs> It's about my other favorite subject, uh, uh, Russia and uh, Putin's Russia. Uh, and in fact, I really do think, uh, although you've done an amazing job of evoking kind of Russia and, and the, the kind of madcap uh, uncertainty of Russia in the 1990s, it, it, it is such important context, of course, for kind of the tragedy of Russia today. So I thought maybe we would actually start a little bit at the end and then work our way backwards because I do think it's important uh, for us to understand, like, why would you write a book, uh, you know, that evokes uh, the Russia of that period of time when it's basically evaporated? It might as well be a book about Russia in, you know, 100 years ago in the sense that uh, we know the fate of Russian democracy, right? And it's, it's over. Uh, it's, you know, was maybe hanging in the balance when you were spending so much time there trying to get Sesame Street made, but um, now it's not hanging in the balance. Um, so tell us a little bit about that world that you conjured up. You, you actually did make a trip back to Russia in 2020, but I assume that almost all the people that you worked with or that you interviewed for this book, are, are any of them even in Russia today? So the, um, I went back in uh, January of 2020 to interview uh, a number of the people for this book, and it was heartbreaking to see this uh, because, you know, the 
um, like the chief director has grandchildren and, you know, they're bereft. They, it's just tragic for them to see what's happened to their country. But I also feel that in writing this book, it was really important to um, look at how um, the past influenced the making of Sesame Street, which I think uh, the, a lot of the values persist today. So that when you look at um, the role that Russian pride plays, and, and um, you know, this, is, this has um, been a, uh, a country with a brutal past, and um, so when the team, our team of, you know, puppeteers and musicians and screenwriters and set designers came together, they had to figure out a way to overcome their past and build a new reality for children, first on television and then hopefully in real life. Mm -hmm. But I do think in telling the stories that a lot of the challenges that we faced, um, you know, first of all, the, the violence uh, and the um, assassination of our broadcast partners, the takeover of the puppet office. Yeah, when I said you were conjuring <laughs> Moscow in the 90s, I, I meant all the, all the bad stuff. How many, <laughs> there are two, two major assassinations figure in the book, plus Boris Berezovsky, who of course later becomes killed. Yeah, the first was a very brave man, Vlad Lysyev, who um, uh, was trying to create press freedom in Russia and he was dealing with uh, corruption in the TV industry and it's rumored that's why he was killed. And the second person, you know, it was a complete out of the blue. I mean, nobody even knew the guy, and then he was killed. But, but I think by looking back to the, the 1990s, we see that this is, this is a pattern. It's much worse now. Now it's, you know, horrific. But, um, you know, this is the reality that the people that I was working with are living in. Mm -hmm. And so trying to come up with, um, a, you know, scenarios that would help children, you know, develop skills and, um, and, and model values was often really fraught because we really did come from different countries. They didn't have democracy for 200 years. Yeah, no, the, uh, the culture class is, is pretty much evident from the first day. And I think, I guess that was one of the questions I had in reading the book. So now we'll just jump back to the beginning about, you know, why you embarked on this in the first place. Do you think that the, the people at Sesame Street, you know, sort of the mothership in New York, uh, you know, were they, were they just very naive about Russia? Or did they, you know, was that, was that different than how they approached other countries? Or did they really, were they sort of evangelists for the kind of universal power of Sesame Street? Why Russia? Just the idea, kind of similar to how we're going to bring them capitalism, we're going to bring them McDonald's, and of course we're going to bring them Sesame Street? Is that the animating factor? No, it's a, it's a very good question. And um, to, to answer that, I feel that it's important to go back to that era because, you know, when I was taking this book around to publishers and I had one publisher that was interested and then uh, they got back to me and they said, well, they showed the book to their young, uh, you know, uh, acquisitions editors and they all said, you know, the, f the book is just a little rah-rah capitalism. <laughs> and I remember thinking these 20-somethings have no idea that you know what we were coming out of after 70 years of com of uh, communism, and um, you know um, fear of nuclear war, that it was it was um, you know uh, the the sentiments that Sesame Street had about bringing the bringing the show and adapting it and creating a culturally sensitive show, not importing Disney or something, was very much. Uh, in line with what most Western leaders and most societies were thinking about. And yes, we were naive. I was naive too in terms of the evangelization about capitalism and maybe thinking that it could happen faster than was ever possible, uh, or if at all. And um, I just think that, uh, um, you know, you, you, in, the, in the context of that era, it's really important to remember that period. Um, but Sesame Street was amazing because, you know, we, we ran out of money. The ruble collapsed. 
the people were killed. The you know the office was taken over, and there were there I wouldn't I would say that it wasn't the entire company that was in favor. There was a faction that was like, this is insane. This is a, this is not good for the brand. Right. <laughs> but. Yeah, you yeah. could kind of feel like it, that it wouldn't happen. Uh, forget about Russia, that, you know, even uh, in the U.S. Uh, today, people would be like, are you insane? Like, you know, like, what will our, our Twitter followers say if we, you know, set up shop in Moscow? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that uh, it, was, it was a really different moment, and I'm glad you made that point. You know, somebody said to me not that long ago, maybe 1989 was the best year of our lives, and we just didn't know it at the time. But, you know, we were generationally very lucky. We didn't realize perhaps what an outlier it would be, but you know, that experience of feeling that the Cold War had ended and that, you know, we were sort of gonna march into this uh, democratic small D future and that clearly informs a lot of this engagement. Although you had been in Russia when it was the Soviet Union, you had studied Russian. When did you start studying Russian? Um, I I went to college in 79 yeah. and I went to Russia in 82, yeah. 1982. Yeah. yeah, so you you know, you know were uh, a lot more fluent obviously than the people you were dealing with in terms of the place and yet for you, what, what was the most eye-opening thing? Just the, the tenuousness of uh, post-Soviet Russia or you know? I, I think I really uh, grossly underestimated the challenges. I mean, I, I thought, oh, I did this documentary and you know, was dealing with uh, conservative, you know, communist fascists. So this has got to be easier. It's puppets, you know. <laughs> I mean, that was sort of where I was thinking. And um, of course, I didn't have any children's television experience. Uh, so it was a very different um, experience trying to do that. Um, but I think the thing that shocked me the most uh, was uh, were the cultural clashes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really understand the depth of the influence of propaganda and the way of Soviet life that had existed for so long. So there were really, uh, you know, multiple experiences and, uh, you know, one was when we, we uh, we're, we uh, assembled the curriculum seminar, and this is when all the uh, educators come from all over the Soviet Union to decide what is the show going to teach young children. And when we, you know, obviously, you know, you just never know what's going to happen at these meetings. Um, but in this case, you know, where we were all um, throwing around ideas for how to um, have scenarios that would model you know, skills that children needed in their new free market and democratic society. <laughs> and I raised my hand and I proposed, well, what about a lemonade stand? <laughs> and the, um, you know, the reaction is, is just, you know, that, that's shameful. You can't have children selling things on the street. And that's true, but uh, in Russia, the only people selling things on the street under communism were, uh, you know, mafia. But there were so many situations like that and, you know, clashes about the, the music for the show. Again, the pride theme, you know, the Russians at, at first only wanted classical music and of course a, you know, let motif of, of Sesame Street is it's fabulous music, very innovative and I wanted to bring in a lot of the uh, musicians that I knew from the 80s who, you know, their music had been banned. So I thought, you know, th anyway, that took months to resolve. And then the Muppets themselves, the, um, the uh, at first my, my colleague said, uh, we don't want your Muppets, we want our puppets. We, uh, you know, we have a strong puppet tradition. Yeah, no, this, this idea of Nasha, you know, the, the idea of, you know, it's ours and the Russian pride, even in the middle of, you know, Russia's lowest decade in some ways, right? This really comes through and I think, to me, that's one of the strongest through lines with the Russia that we're dealing with right now. Uh, and Putin was so successful at both um, uh, channeling and, and, and cultivating that grievance. Uh, and yet here you have, you know, long before the appearance of, 
you know, Vladimir Putin in the in the political world, you have uh, you know, a woman in state TV saying, well, we don't um, we don't watch your Muppets. Uh, we have our own puppets. We don't watch your music. You know, you know, we don't need your stinking Sesame Street. Basically, right. <laughs> is right. is the idea, and it's very interesting uh, because it, to me that is, I think, uh, somebody once said when we lived there just a few years later, uh, you know, and this was actually Putin's pollster uh, who helped to bring him to power and later broke with him as many did. And he said to us, you know, uh, Russia's like any country, like a river and the river is flowing this direction. And, you know, for a few years, uh, Boris Yeltsin as people tried to dam up the river or make it go in the other direction. Vladimir Putin, you know, he's just going with the river. If it wasn't him, it would be somebody else who was going with the river. R Russia is the river. And I think that's one of the things I really appreciated about the book. Uh, what, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what the message ultimately ended up being. Because actually, I mean, I don't want to spoil the ending here, uh, you know, but Sesame Street does get made uh, in, in Russia. And, uh, you know, otherwise it would probably have been hard for you to <laughs> write the book, I guess. But, <laughs> but what do you think the message of Russian Sesame Street ultimately was? And, you know, it, it no longer is showing in Russia today. Is, was Russian Sesame Street actually incompatible with Putin's Russia? Um, I would say no, that I believe that there are always people, um, and I, you know, met hundreds and hundreds of them who envision a different future for Russia. They're there. And, um, you know, many of the people that I worked with, you asked earlier what happened to them, uh, many of them had to flee in the last couple of months overnight after being vocal against the war. Um, and I've been in touch with them regularly on WhatsApp, including uh, people who have children who are on the Russian side fighting against Ukraine. So it's, it's you know, these are people, I, and I, I, you know, the, the, the messages I sent were neutral because I wasn't sure how people would respond. And, um, but I, I am, I, I, do, I do believe those people are there and that, um, you know, there, there's, there was so much hope in an earlier period. I just think that um, this is, you know, all wars end. So it's heartbreaking, but wars do end. Yeah, well, that I think is one thing that's interesting, right? The the narratives are written, you know, were controlled by those who end up holding power. And Putin has been very successful, uh, even you know, two decades ago when he first came to power, at kind of rewriting the narrative of the '90s to rewrite that hope right out of it and to rewrite the idea that there was a part of Russia that wanted a democratic small d future because his story rested on the idea that it was just chaos and gangland shootings and and those existed and you literally encountered them uh, trying to make a children's show about puppets which tells you a lot about Russia in the 1990s. Um, what was it like, tell people, a little, give people a little bit of a flavor for you know what it was like uh, you know in even trying to put something on television at that time because of course propaganda was and is uh, so important and you, you actually were in the belly of the beast of uh, the main uh, state television. Uh, uh, the, la the, last, the last time I was in the building, so Astankana, which is the you know, uh, Russian, the largest Russian TV station that um, had during Soviet time and then just after the fall of the Soviet Empire sent a signal out to 11 time zones, throw one seventh of the world's surface. And, um, you know, I, I, when I was there in 2020, I thought, they, they, I was met by two um, FSB agents who were probably wondering, what the hell is this American doing inside our TV station, you know? But when we were there, um, there were a number of people that were uh, challenging uh, propaganda, and money was having an enormous effect on power. So uh, we were in the middle of an enormous transition, which is why the TV station kept getting taken over by various factions. And, um, uh, but I do think that, you know, speaking about the narrative that you're talking about with Putin is that you know, there's like, a, there's like a stick, and on either side of the stick is Russian pride and humility. And where we found compromise was figuring out how to balance that stick between the two. Because, um, 
you know, there is, there is enormous humiliation um, in terms of what happened in the, in the 1990s, in the early 1990s. And, you know, I remember thinking at the time that this really has to go a lot slower and we really need educational programs that are modeling the transition, you know, for all ages for this to happen. It cannot happen quickly. And that really wasn't the perspective of USAID and the, uh, the government and, and Western European uh, countries. They were all about, you know, stabilizing the ruble and macroeconomics. And I just felt like they were l l really missing a piece of the consciousness of the people. And, and this applies to all nations all over the world, and we keep missing it. You know, it's funny because when we were there, again, just a few years later, uh, the big talk uh, in, in the early 2000s after Putin came to power was about how Russia had, quote, graduated, that was the term that everybody was using, graduated uh, from U.S. aid, uh, which, of course, was not actually true, and even the people promoting that phrase knew it wasn't true. They simply needed to move on to send that money to uh, Iraq uh, mm -hmm. and Afghanistan. But... Um, I just I found the phrase itself like betrays kind of the mindset that you encountered, which is the idea that we're just going to sort of like write checks for a few years and then um, everything will be fine. So, but I do want to go back to this question of what was what was the most important thing that you wanted Sesame Street to convey to Russians at kids at that fraught period, or did you even know? I mean, it's, I feel like reading the book that you learned along the way a little bit better what you wanted to have the program say. Absolutely. I mean, it was, it was an incredible opportunity and learning experience for me. And, you know, I changed, you know, not only intellectually, but also personally. In my personal life, many things changed. Had, you know, got married, had a baby. I mean, there was a lot going on. But in, in terms of the show, um, what I found most revealing was in the writer's room where uh, conversations took place that, um, you know, where they were trying to write scripts, but they were having trouble because Sesame Street's so fun and lighthearted and has, and, and riffs on popular jokes in the culture. Yeah. And the writers would say, uh, but we don't have any shared culture yet because our, our past, which is Soviet culture, it's too raw. You know, it hurts too much to like joke about that, so that's off limits. So how do we make a show that's going to um, reflect this new Russia that doesn't even exist yet? How do we write this? And what they came to, to realize is that they had to make it up. And they knew they wanted it to be, a, you know, sweeter, kinder, gentler place because Russia was brutal up till then. And an example of that is, you know, as you're, um, you're writing a scenario that happens in the bakery, we have a bakery on the set and a bicycle repair place. And how do people greet each other? Well, in Soviet times, I mean, you were there, basically you come in and there's the aficionska who, you know, doesn't smile and it's very, uh, it might be a long line to get your bread and um, in this case, they, they wrote scripts where people would model, hello, thank you, may I please help you? I mean, it sounds really silly. But no, but anyone who has been in Russia can tell you that nobody said those words. Right, right. And then, and then over time... By the way, they still didn't really. <laughs> you know? Well, our 20-year-olds and people who are 30 now who grew up on Sesame Street, they, they you know, I, I think they're... They, 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 we should change them, but there were so many things. I mean, one, one other example is the, um, initially the group, uh, the creative team and the researchers did not want to have show any disabled children. And, you know, we showed them a clip of a child in a wheelchair with a kite, and they said, that is so exploitative to show a child in a wheelchair on television. And, you know, I thought, well, wow, these are really enlightened uh, educators, uh, maybe Sesame Street, they're not ready for Sesame Street. And then um, this woman raises her hand and says, you just don't understand that there are um, many children who will never have a wheelchair in their life. 
because the country is too poor to provide one. We're not even paying the army right now. Teachers aren't getting their salaries. So think about the kids that would be trapped in their bed and seeing other children on the TV show with a wheelchair. So there was a lot of debate about that, but it didn't end up happening because then this other woman raised her hand from a, a town where uh, Chuvash, where they have a lot of, um, uh, the Soviet government had dumped hazardous chemicals. So there were a lot of children with deformities. And she said, I work with these children every day. They, I laugh with them, I you know, teach them. They want to, to play with normal children. And she used the word normal niadeti, you know, normal children, and I, which is you know, kind of horrifying anyway. But um, anyway, after uh, she finishes spe speaking, I look around, and the people who had spoken against having kids in, uh, disabled kids in the show were like shifting in their seats uncomfortably, and then a couple of people were crying. And I realized in that moment that I was losing it too, that you know, I'm supposed to be the one like kind of you know, setting an example of like, we're gonna make this all work, you know? And I was a mess. And it was just this type of release that you had all the time, because you had just seen a moment of transition when the whole group came together and said, yes, we do want this. We do want this in our show. We want our show to be a show that is, you know, promotes tolerance and acceptance. Yeah, it's, it's just a remarkable thing because, it, you know, you were swimming against the current in Russia, and of course the, the current now has reverted. Uh, talk to us a little bit about race, which is another issue that comes up uh, in its portrayal. Russia and the Soviet Union was a vast, multi-ethnic, diverse empire uh, but it was not a tolerant, diverse empire, as you discovered. Yes, uh, most notably that, uh, you know, uh, until um, uh, shortly after the Soviet Union collapse, you had Jew written in the passport. Um, but it was, uh, it was fascinating to have these discussions about, um, about uh, nationality or race um, because there were so many former republics that had split off in 91, you know, including Ukraine. And when we worked together, we had everybody on our team. We had Georgian animators who were the best. We had Armenian writers, um, Ukrainian filmmakers. Everybody worked together. There was really no, no problem within our team. But as you said, you know, there was enormous racism against what, uh, you know, um, Russians often use the word as chornia, so black, you know, people who were from Kazakhstan or Chechens. And when we were holding the curriculum seminar, it was very complicated because it was at that moment that the Chechens had um, taken a bunch of Russian nationals hostage in a town of Budyanovsk. And our team had to push through this in order to uh, come up with the curriculum, which was very hard for them because they were, you know, it was, it was the first attack by a republic on the on Russian nationals at the time. So that was that was um, difficult for them to focus. Um, but there is there is still, you know, extreme uh, racism and. These questions came up as well related to who are the actors going to be? You know, were they going to be white Russians or, um, you know, would we have diversity? How inclusive would this show be? And in the end, the team chose to uh, have children from uh, many different nationalities. Yeah, that's another way it seems very much at odds with uh, a Russia that has literally gone to war with its neighbor claiming its that brothers. they uh, don't exist uh, as a people. Um, and, you know, I guess that's, uh, we can get back to the politics, but really just it's also kind of a story about doing business uh, in, in Russia at this period of time. I mean, there's this fantastic scene where <laughs> you've just had your baby and you're literally like putting $8,000, uh, you know, in cash in your bra in order to get across the line. I really sympathize with that. I actually, did, right after 9-11, uh, all the Moscow correspondents, including me and my husband, ended up sort of like pulled into covering the war in Afghanistan. So of course we had to like come and go with uh, a tons of cash as well as sophisticated technology, you know, sat phones and stuff that they didn't have. And we were just constantly terrified. I mean, I was like, you know, 
I don't even carry $20 now. And I was like carrying $10,000 at a time and just praying that they didn't, you know, stop me. And what would I say? Uh, oh, it's, it's incredible that you did that in yeah. Afghanistan. I mean, that terrifies me a great deal more than what well, I went that, through. <laughs> that was very scary. But re remember, the gangland killings had ceased in, in our neighborhood. Uh, they had, you know, been going on when we first got there. But they had, Putin did manage to restore what they called the, the vertical of power. Uh, but, you know, when you were there, I mean, Moscow was, you know, and St. Petersburg were extremely dangerous, essentially gangland um, turf battles going on all around you. Uh, it, you know, I mean, did you have anyone that you thought was a good guide in the end? You have this friend who is a recurring character, uh, Leonid. Leonid. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't really come across thinking that he actually knew what, what the heck he was really doing either, like as far as like doing business there. Is that, is that fair? I, I think it's fair to say that neither one of us knew what we were doing. I mean, like, like Leonid, he wasn't like some, you know, like savvy black marketeer who'd, you know, like cut his teeth selling jeans on the street or something, was he? I mean, he didn't no, seem like No, no, he was, he was actually a journalist, yeah. And a quite well-known one who broke the first story on uh, political prisoners in psychiatric hospitals. Yes. That's a famous how I, story. Yeah, that's how I met him working uh, for NBC News at the time. And uh, but uh, we had, uh, you know, Vlad Lysyev was very helpful in guiding us. We had uh, Igor Maloshenko, who was the head of NTV, uh, the other, you know, TV station. But uh, we d really didn't know, and there were sometimes arguably among those uh, responsible for bringing Vladimir Putin to power. I should note. <laughs> yes, that's very true. Uh, so, um, but I think you know, uh, Igor Malchenko committed suicide. Um, I mean, he. Th I think this. A lot of people that were involved in trying to create a better future for this country uh, were uh, sideswiped. Okay, so you and Leonid are like, you know, two big, ki two kids in the big city. Uh, <laughs> you have no idea what you're doing. You're like, okay, I've got this big, famous American brand. And what what was the scariest moment for you? I mean, you know, what was it like to actually I do think, business in Russia? Then? I think one of the scariest moments was, um, you know, aside from the, the people I knew who were assassinated, but I, I never felt like... Uh, you know, I was personally in danger because I, I had no money and, you know, I had, mm -hmm. I had, I, I just didn't feel it. And, um, but um, when we were uh, negotiating with um, the group of 12, which were uh, a group of businessmen in, um, in the early, early days of trying to raise the money for the, for the TV series from Russian uh, investors. And we went to this meeting and it was behind um, you know, uh, a fence and there were um, uh, security guards that were armed and we went into this place. And I, I think I had sort of, this was in so pretty early on, so before anybody had gotten killed. And I thought I was just making a puppet show, this is gonna be great. And so when that happened and these men that I met uh, made it clear that they were essentially propping up the Russian government and the only reason Yeltsin was there was because they were keeping him there. They were, you know, they said something like, when I said, how do you know you'll be able to get these loans from the government, you know, in order to give us the money that we need for the show? And they said, you know, Dan uh, Yeltsin will dance to any tune we sing. Those people frightened me. Um, and uh, we never did the deal with them. Um, but that, that, was a, that was scary to kind of be surrounded by all these men and feel that, you know, testosterone power and the money and that, you know, what if we failed? What if, and I, I said to Leonid, my, my wayward partner, and I said, well, what if, we, what if we don't succeed and they give us the money? What's going to happen to us? And uh, he said, he said, oh, nothing, he says, and then he turns around and, and guarantees to them that we'll get the show made. And, <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is really scary. Yeah, never make a promise to a Russian oligarch you can't keep, right? That's right. <laughs> no, uh, we had a friend uh, who worked at one of the big American law firms that came into Russia 
uh, right around this time, many of the big law firms, especially those that focused on things like uh, energy deals mm. uh, because of Russia's importance as an oil and gas supplier, were opening up offices in this period, uh, uh, law firms, uh, accounting firms, things like this. But that meant inevitably that they had to get in bed and they had to work with these Russian oligarchs because there's this great scene actually in the book where you're trying to explain that uh, you go back to New York and they're mad at you over these meetings and, you know, you're essentially saying, well, who do you want me to do business with? There's no one else there. <laughs> and I asked our friend who had, who had been in Moscow, you know, for more than a decade at this point, I said, well, you, know, you have all these clients that come in here. You know, would you really like, do you really think it's a good idea for them to be? Because he would, you know, they would always be getting, you know, like, pulled off planes at gunpoint and, you know, like having all their money stolen and like literally their corporations stolen, things like, you know, crazy stuff like that. Um, and I said, you know, is this, does this make sense for your clients? And he said, no, absolutely not. They never asked me the one question. If they asked me the question, like, should I do business in Russia? He said, there's actually no justification. <laughs> and again, this is a few years later, but he said, there's actually no justification for any American firm doing any business here unless you're in the oil and gas or energy extraction uh, business because the risks far, far outweigh it. Uh, this was a few years later, and this was a person who was probably pretty jaded at that point. But... I do feel like there's a certain element of like your own inexperience is the only reason that you kept doing this. I kept thinking like there's no way I would want to make a show if it was this hard to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, I, I you know people often ask me why why did you just keep doing that and you know my my husband at the time was you know often begging me not to especially by the time I was pregnant. But I couldn't leave. I mean these people that I was working with, my team that they were committed, they were passionate. And, you know, they, what, el what other choice did they have? And I always felt like that. I mean, even in the 80s when I was in, in the Soviet Union, I felt that, you know, sure, America has its problems. Yeah, we have threats to democracy then, now. But, you know, we're not Russia. And uh, we have certain uh, advantages being a more stable society and not having exactly the same experiences. Um, that remains to be seen, um, as you know so well. But, uh, but I couldn't leave uh, my team. And, um, you know, they, even when, when all these things happened, you know, where, and literally some of that, sometimes we were not able to pay them for months at a time, they would put their own money in. You know, they would collect it from people. This w it wasn't possible for me to go. No, the incredible resilience, I mean, you know, and resourcefulness of people, uh, it comes through really well in the book as well. So I want to make sure that we have time for questions as well. There should be, yes, there's, there's a microphone here right next to the pillar. Uh, if you just want to stand up and uh, line up, we'd love to take some questions as well. And while people are getting their questions ready, I will throw in a moderator's prerogative. What... Um, what do you think Americans get wrong the most about Russia? I mean, you know, they must ask you all the time, especially over the last few months of the war. What, what do you think that people don't really understand? For one, the resilience of the Russian people. And um, we often, um, we often guess, they, I would say that they often guess wrong about what we're going to do, and we often guess wrong about what they're going to do. And um, at the same time, I think that... By the way, that's actually really a scary thought in the middle of a nuclear confrontation, but... <laughs> but <laughs> very scary, very scary. Um, but I, I don't... Uh, I'm not sure... Um, um, I'm not sure exactly uh, how to answer that. Um, I think uh, I think that what what we get wrong also is when we expect a country to mirror America, and we do this in many countries. And they have different histories. They have different cultures. This is the same. I worked on the Mexican. Sesame Street, and it was the same problem. Um, so, 
you know, if you want to understand these cultures and work with them and find compromises, in this case, with what's happening, it's, it's you know, an impossible situation. But, um, you know, y you do get to this point a lot earlier, um, you know, in terms of mistakes that were made and misunderstanding. Okay. Please jump in. I'll go first. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Naomi Moland. I'm a professor at American University. And um, I wrote a book a couple years ago about the Nigerian version of Sesame Street. It's called Can Big Bird Fight Terrorism? And there, one of the big issues with kind of the different ethnic groups in Nigeria was a lot on language. And so when you mentioned that there were several different um, actors from the different regions, the different nationalities close to Russia, what did they do in terms of language? How did they decide? Did they include any non-Russian languages on the program? Did they decide to include language in, in a way to, um, yeah, to kind of recognize the diversity that was within the Russian organization? And how did they, how did they recognize? Because sometimes uh, ethnicity is not always visibly obvious, mm -hmm. um, I assume, in many parts of. So I'm curious how they worked with kind of the language question mm -hmm. on the show. That's an excellent question. And, um, Thank you for writing about the Sesame I, Street yeah, in Nigeria. I, <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, we, there was a decision made that the show was going to be in Russian. That decision was made because uh, at that point, the education across the former Soviet Union was in Russian. So children were still being educated in Russian, including in Ukraine. Um, and uh, this is, you know, I mean, many people don't know, but even um, Zelensky's show, his comedy show, is in Russian, and that was 2015, I think, yeah, um, because of the market, basically. Um, but the way that the, sh the, um, the creative team came up with uh, addressing different nationality was primarily through art. And we had all different kinds of, um, uh, folklore and native arts from the different republics and the children would would do that and then there would be an explanation about you know w what is the source of this art and what does it say about the country so that's essentially how it was dealt with they didn't they didn't really address it through language at least not in the first season and I'm not sure what happened afterwards hi um, my question is about you're talking about the story about the the writers kind of grappling with like will people actually like Sesame Street if it has the things that make it Sesame Street in the United States when imported to Russia and how there was difference of opinion among the writers but then later when these episodes actually started coming out did you find that like the the concerns that people had about these like cultural translation issues were borne out through the reception to the show um, or not, or you know, were the problems actually worse, or were they less intense than the writers expected? Like, did the writers actually accurately guess what would happen? Yeah, um, I think uh, the um, the show was a hit from the day it aired. I mean, it was it was surreal watching it go across the the eleven time zones and the reaction to it. So, um, I would say, f according to the writers, they. They, they hit the nail on the head in terms of um, capturing it, what made a show quintessentially Russian. Mm -hmm. And it, it really doesn't look like the American show. Mm. Um, an example of this is the set. So when we were creating the set, uh, the set designer who had only done theatrical productions Whoa. wanted to build a set that would appeal all across the former Soviet Union. And there were many, uh, you've probably seen this in, in all kinds of East European countries where there are these Soviet, you know, cement block mm -hmm. buildings. They're called Khrushchevui, which is a combination of the word Khrushchev and slum. Wow. <laughs> no. And um, so we definitely wanted some of them on our set because that was, that was definitely the former Soviet Union. And then um, the set designer asked what, uh, and she had these meetings with the writers. She said, I don't know what the set should be. Should it be pre-revolutionary Russia? Should it be the Soviet recent past? Or should it be some future that we don't know? And when she, she, she left and uh, came back with drawings that, were, that had a spaceship 
and an elephant. And I remember the drawings were gorgeous. They were like, the, the illustrations were so uh, beautifully done that they were like museum botanist drawings, you know. And I just kind of kept bringing up this idea, well, you know, there really aren't really elephants in <laughs> Russia, you know. And, and, and it was like the writers, when the writers were, um, the writers were writing scripts and we, they were writing separately from each other, but we got something like 10 scripts where they were all leaving Russia <laughs> in, you know, to go to France to eat foie gras and fine cheese. And, you know, we, we thought, what is this? I mean, we, we need the children to study geography in their own country. And um, so we brought that up and we just mentioned it. And of course the writer said, oh, well, yeah, I see the point, you know. <laughs> but of course, they hadn't been able to travel legally. That was the first time. So they're, they're, they're writers, they're humanists. They're like, yeah, let's, let's expand our horizons. Hello. Hello. Remember me? I do. I do. Okay. We actually went to graduate school together in the 1990s, and we actually watched a lot of the changes happen in the Soviet Union through Soviet media. And, you know, even starting in the late 80s, the whole Glasnost thing. And a lot of that was in the youth, you know, redaxia, the you know, editorial division. And they were pushing boundaries, you know, right and left. So how do you, it's just interesting to me to think about studying Soviet media throughout the 90s and how the media really was doing some things that were, you, know, you would never have dreamed of. What was different about children's television that made it so different? Yeah. Or maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, for, for one, even in the Soviet era, um, children's television was like its own special division mm -hmm. that was protected. Um, and they were not under the same censorship rules mm -hmm. that other media was. The only other media was political media because they didn't have any uh, dramatic TV series. They had the one. The only one they had before Sesame Street was a show that had 12 episodes. So we were the first to make 52 half hours, and it was like doing a moonshot. Mm -hmm. And most people that we worked with in the beginning, trying to get them to do production budgets and schedules, they were like, "This is impossible. This is impossible. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. This is just not possible." So, um, but so that was the the children's a area was protected. And then the other factor I think we faced is, is there was only one other show in Russia at the time, Spokoini Nochi Malashi, mm -hmm. and the children really had nothing. Mm -hmm. So we, they were, maybe they were kinder to us when we uh, proposed doing the show uh, because uh, the state wasn't providing any funding to the children's television department, mm -hmm. so they weren't able to do production. Mm -hmm. And we were raising the money from private Russian investors, and we had matching funds from USAID. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's probably why. And um, as far as how it was different, um, I think in the, for news and, and every other sector, media was pushing the boundaries, mm -hmm. which is why people were getting killed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was, it was just an incredible, unprecedented period, as you yeah. know from yeah studying it, it, you know, this, this, in, this period. Yeah. I hope we see it again. <laughs> so, Natasha, we just have a couple minutes left. I guess I'd love you to leave us with a few thoughts about, you know, how do you feel about this experiment? Now, you, you mentioned sort of the Russia's Sesame St Street generation. Will they end up being sort of a, you know, a kind of um, evolutionary dead end? You know, the young people who were educated and, you know, sort of shown that there could be a different way forward. There's this lovely kind of moment when you go back to Moscow in 2020 and you're uh, checking into your hotel and the young women uh, at the counter are so young that they actually grew up watching your Russian Sesame Street uh, and the kids today will not have that experience. So. You know, is anybody like doing research into your your Sesame Street, you know, Pakalenia in 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 Russia? What what do you think? I mean, hazard a guess. We 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 won't, you know, hold you to it. <laughs> but what do you think? Yeah, I I um, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, uh, there I don't know if anybody's doing any research. Um, there's no way it's possible to do Sesame Street now. 
Um, but these people who made that show and the, the people who made the show uh, for the next 10 years after that, um, they're all over the place and they're still doing their art. And, you know, artists will always do what they do. They will always be trying to create a more humanist reality. You know, so I do believe that, um, that wherever we can, we should support them not cancel them, and, uh, mm -hmm. and find a way to uh, create opportunities where we can infiltrate and um, create a different reality for people living in that country. Well, that is a pretty uh, big and important sentiment to end on, so I just want to Thank you for writing the book and uh, for sharing this story for us. I should also say that it's also a little bit, I don't want to give away the ending either, but it is a little bit of a love story too. Uh, and your husband who you meet and marry in the course of the book is here as well, Ken Rogoff. So, uh, you know, congratulations, husband. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. This was wonderful and uh, really I, I so enjoyed talking with you. and meeting you for the first time. So and by the great. way, this is a sneak preview. The book is Muppets in Moscow, The Unexpected Making of Sesame Street in Russia, but it's not officially even out uh, until uh, Monday. Monday. So uh, you can buy it today and be the first to have Muppets in Moscow. And I know you are happy to sign books as well. Happy right? to sign. And thank you all for coming. It means so much to me. Uh, my husband and I lived in DC with my daughter who's here as well uh, for many years and it's a second home to us and I have many friends in the audience too so this has been really lovely so thank you for for your time too